We remember Yamasaki today as the, as the designer of the World Trade Center in New York, the twin towers that unfortunately were lost on 9-11. Beyond that, he was a leader in what we call mid-century modernism, which took the basic uh, efficiency of modernism, glass and steel and clean lines, and kind of infused it with some warmth and, and beauty that we associate more with something like the arts and crafts movement. Yama, uh, what we say, um, uh, softened and humanized modernism in some really important ways. So many modernists had struggled for so long before the 50s to try to create and convince people of a modern architecture that didn't rely on the past, that was of the 20th century and didn't need to use arches and, and other elements from the history. We will succeed in creating the first modern, technological, humane, prosperous civilization. Inspired by his travels, he was incorporating Sure, elements of Italian Renaissance architecture and French Gothic architecture. He was using Islamic arches and he was using the notion of the screened window from Islamic architecture. He used a lot of elements from Japanese architecture. So he didn't limit himself to the Western history like some modernists tried to. He really was a pioneer global architect. The problem was that in the mid-50s, Modernism was still very strong and still very influenced towards rejecting that historical past. At the end of World War II, the Detroit firm of Smith Inchman Grills was looking for a new chief designer and heard about this young Minoru Yamasaki in New York and hired him to come to Detroit. And I think like a lot of people who come from far away from Detroit, he probably thought he would be here for a couple of years and move on. And instead, he spent the rest of his life here. Well, Yamasaki started out with Smith Hinchman doing the first modernist building in Detroit, the Federal Reserve Building in downtown Detroit. It was highly praised and much imitated. As early as 1948, he was really pushing the envelope uh, for these sleek lines and large glass windows. Uh, and the annex is a beautiful example of that. People walk by every day and don't even really notice that that is one of the most famous architects in the world. He got his reputation fairly quickly here. He did schools everywhere. And then he became Wayne State University's almost in-house architect. He did their McGregor Conference Center uh, on the campus, which is one of his very best buildings. And by that time, his reputation was growing and he started doing buildings around America and around the world. McGregor is really, I think, in the architectural world considered to be his masterpiece. It's the one of the first buildings he designed after his world tour. And it goes farther, I think, than any other work that he did in terms of incorporating disparate elements and disparate influences from around the world. For instance, it has uh, elements of a Greek temple to it. It has elements of a Gothic cathedral. It has a little bit of those uh, Islamic screens that I mentioned. Pools outside the building, it's a very Japanese sort of uh, atmosphere. And he kind of brings all these different ideas together. And in the other work that he does after this, he never seems to reach out to as many different kind of influences as he did at McGregor. Plus, McGregor, I think, is just well done in terms of the details and the proportions and the relationship between the inside and the outside. In the 50s, Yama began to work on a project for the Michigan Consolidated Gas Company, which needed a new headquarters, and he created what is now known as One Woodward, a, a skyscraper. It was his first skyscraper. People don't realize this, but it, it wasn't even completed at the time that he was hired to do the World Trade Center which was going to be the world's tallest buildings. And here he had just a couple of tall building designs under his belt. But one of the things that's evident even in that building, his first skyscraper, is that he's looking for a different way to do it. The typical way of designing skyscrapers back then and constructing them was uh, you use a steel frame and you build it up as many stories as you need and then you cover it with some sort of skin, which at that point was a lot of glass and maybe a little bit of metal. And he felt like that was becoming too kind of commercial and packaged, and he wanted to find a different kind of expression. One thing that Yamasaki was always trying to do in his public buildings is to bring the public in, to have them feel comfortable, to have the, be the buildings be beautiful. I think one of the other criticisms that uh, struck me as I researched his work was 
the number of times that he used the word beauty in the 50s and 60s when other architects weren't. When I think about what Yamazaki gave to architecture, besides a lot of great buildings that are still there and, and will be there like McGregor, at the same time the notion that any important public building needs to have uh, some uh, outdoor space for users, a plaza, landscaping, uh, greenways, bike paths, a sculpture garden, anything like that. That is so part of our architectural and planning DNA now that you can't conceive of an important building that would ignore that stuff. And you don't necessarily think that that's what Yamazaki gave us, but in fact it is what he gave us.